Hi, I'm Matthew Quinn from Future Sales Factory. And welcome to another one of our business roots chats. I'm here with Helen McCormack. She's the vice chair at Inverclyde Community Fund and also a director at Rig Arts. Hi, Helen. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Excellent. So, Inverclyde Community Fund. Tell us what that's all about. So, Inverclyde Community Fund is a group of trustees who give um, grants to small groups and organisations, small charities. Um, roughly about £1,000. It's all for organisations in Inverclyde and the trustees are all volunteers. And there's also lots of kind of milestones along the way. So obviously um, you're getting a good community spirit out of this and you're increasing goodness in the community. And then you've got the bigger organisations that you're managing the funds for that have also, they're also making that impact. Yeah. And that's kind of where the, the altruistic nature of it comes from. Totally. I mean, a lot of these organisations, and it's not just big organisations, ideally what we want to do is get local businesses as well asking us to manage their funds for them. Because mm -hmm. a lot of local businesses, people come in all the time and say, oh, could we get £500 for this or could we have £200 for that? And they don't always know um, that they're the right organisations to help. Oh, yeah. This way, we've got governance in place. We've got a fabulous team of trustees that are across the public sector, private sector and third sector with experience. So we just be able to check that the money is going to the right thing and it's you know showing a difference in the community. We also um, hand out sustainability grants. So an example of that is recently in one of the organisations came to us and said they wanted to plant apple trees mm -hmm. in schools within Inverclyde so they go to the schools they plant the apple trees schools and community groups plant the apple trees and the kids get to help with the planting mm -hmm. and they also get to see what you do with the fruit once it's it's grown so you see the whole life cycle of the and they've done it they've done it so and they, that's yeah. the exciting thing they're not sitting on a computer in the in the school they're Jeez. actually out in the gardens doing this Fantastic. and some of their faces when they get the you know, when they've grown something, it's amazing. And how long have you been involved in? in I've Flight? been roughly four years. I've and you're been... a volunteer as well? Yeah, yeah. So this is where Rig Arts as well comes in? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Rig Arts. So Rig Arts is, is a lot of fabulous artists who work with the community. It's a similar kind of thing, but it's mm -hmm. one of the, the social enterprises that's in Inverclyde. And these people are amazing artists and they do lots of different things with the community to show help grow and develop people mm -hmm. in terms of art and also help make a difference by showing the things that they can actually build together. So a lot of this Helen feels like very community spirited is this something you wanted to do when you were young? Um, I don't think so well I've always really liked people and I've liked where I live I live in Inverclyde mm -hmm. I think Inverclyde's a fabulous place and I've always wanted to help do things to make a difference. But when I was young, I was ha I wanted a career. Right. So if you if you kind of transport yourself back to the 12-year-old Helen, what were your aspirations then? What did you actually think you were going to do with your life? I totally wanted to be a teacher. Oh, did you? Yeah, wanted to be a teacher. That was the thing that from a very young age, and I think it was a, a lot about the teachers I had when I was young I mm. really respected and that's what I wanted to do. So they were inspirational to you and and, and uh, you looked at the teachers and went, this is what I want to do. And again, that's a very community-spirited thing. It's a very altruistic part of it. Um, so, so how long did that kind of dream last? Well, um, when I was leaving, when I was at fifth year in school, I had good O-levels and hires. So um, then I realised I had to go to university and instead I wanted to go and start working and earning money. Right. So I left school and started work at 16 as a typist, an audio typist. Okay. Worked for three years in a company and the company then unfortunately was closing because they were moving out of Inverclyde. And I applied for jobs and I got a job in IBM, which was the place to work in Inverclyde in those days. So when I started working in there as a clerical assistant, I think I was initially, it was just a fabulous place to work. In secretarial work, what happened is you could only reach a certain level and there wasn't a higher place to go. Mm -hmm. So at the part of IBM I was working in initially were some of the first people to get computers. Okay. So when I went in at first, it was a typewriter, manual typewriter with a wee fancy yeah. box at the side, which was a magnetic card reader. Mm -hmm. and you could actually type something and then put the magnetic card in the reader and it typed it back with no mistakes. So that, in those days, was like state-of-the-art. And then the group I worked with 
we were the first ones to actually get computers in IBM. But I realised I couldn't progress my career if I didn't if I stayed in secretarial. And one of the good things about the company at the time was every year you had an appraisal. And then second part, like, how are you doing? The second part was, what do you want to be? Right. So you could say, I want to be whatever. And they would try their best to help you get there, which was amazing. So I moved out of secretarial into facilities admin. And it was the opposite side of this two and a half mile site. Right. And nobody down there had used a computer. It was all facilities engineers, mm -hmm. electricians, painters, etc. And they all had books in their drawer with all, for example, a million pound project to build a cafeteria. And they were deducting the money manually. On so so they like accounts books and spreadsheets and... and in the desk. I've, I've just bought 20 tables for this cafeteria and that's cost me... Six hundred pounds. Yeah. So, so they were manually writing it <laughs> okay. and seriously in books. So when I went down there, the plan was I was going to be the person typing this into a computerized system right. that was being put in place, and they were all amazed that I could actually turn the computer on because they didn't know how to do that. So I became very valuable to them very quickly. You're like a woman from the future. <laughs> They're like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like how clever this woman is. She could turn the computer I could, on. I could turn it. They were all terrified. Not all of them, but a lot of them were absolutely terrified about technology and then they were not interested at all. Mm. So I initially was putting the input into the computer and then they realised I could actually program it. I could do the, the setting up of the system. So gradually, over a few years, I ended up taking over running the system. And at that point, they'd realised I had leadership potential, and that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. With IBM, they would recognise something like that. There was not a lot of females in IBM at that point in time. So it was. Um, I ended up becoming a manager, mm -hmm. applying to become a manager. And they had a, another great system, which was hands-on training, so anyone that had worked in the office environment to become a manager, you would go and spend three months in the manufacturing line and learn about the rest of the business. The rest and... of the business. Okay. So I did that and became a manager in that area that I had been in. And during all of that, I had never ever I had managed to get an HMC in business studies by going to night school, but I had never had this degree thing that mm. I'd thought all these really clever people have got degrees. I was gaining a lot of business experience, but I always felt there was something that I didn't have that potentially if I got further in my career, it would be a problem. So at that point, IBM had come out and said they were going to do a MBA, an in-company MBA. Mm -hmm. So they brought Strathclyde Uni, um, the lecturers into IBM to teach people and also had to go to Strathclyde at various different times. Mm -hmm. So... Wanted to do it. I just became a manager about a year, but I was also wanting to have a family. So I was like, should I have? Should I try now? And then I decided, I'll I'll just see if it, I might get pregnant. I might not. Mm -hmm. So a year into my MBA, I'm pregnant with my first daughter, okay. and left IBM. Well, I went off maternity leave. While I was off, um, six weeks after my daughter was born, I had an exam up in. University, which was very traumatic, but I survived. <laughs> There's all of these things just landing all at the same time, you know, kind of management, the, the exams, daughters, all that kind of stuff. But that must have been exciting um, as well it's as terrifying. <laughs> yes, I'm trying to use a positive word. <laughs> it was it was terrifying. Yes, let's just say no, the but truth. it was it was good because it was it was things I wanted, you know. Yeah, exactly. And I, I just I worked hard for it's it. It's good stress, isn't it? Sometimes yeah. things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So your your word um, that we put up on the front of this is attitude. Tell tell us where that kind of comes in. What, what's the attitude all about? One of the best things I ever learned, which was a bit later on than that, so I hadn't realised it at first, was I had gone to hear this really inspirational speaker and she was talking about choose your attitude. Mm -hmm. And it made me realise that you can decide, you can't influence what people say or do to you, mm -hmm. but what you can do is influence how you react to it. And that message has been so powerful for me yeah. because it made me think sometimes awful things happened mm -hmm. and I can just get really down about it or what can I control? So knowing that I could control my attitude 
was amazing. Yeah, it makes a big difference to how you project yourself onto people, I suppose, and, and, and how you deal with some of the stuff that's coming back at you. Yeah, and some of the times you just think, I'm going to have a bad attitude. Yeah, of course. Or I'm going to be depressed. Mm. But it's you in control it's then, that's deep. the difference. Uh -huh. yeah, absolutely. Did you pass the exam? Yes. Good. <laughs> it was a master's at an MBA. And when I'd come back to work in the manufacturing line, I was working shifts with my one-year-old child mm -hmm. and finishing that off. So after that, I thought, nothing can be this hard of it again. No, that's, that's a fairly... <laughs> Um, intense couple of years, I would I would imagine from the from you know when you spread it all out. So now you've got this MBA, you've got your daughter that's yeah. a, a year old at the time. Um, you're on the manufacturing plant. What happens next? Well, the, the, as I say, the good thing about IBM is you can move. What they believed in was teach you leadership skills, mm -hmm. and if you're a leader, you don't have to know, you don't have to be experienced in that one like IT or in yeah. engineering or whatever, as long as you know how to manage people, mm -hmm. how to lead people, you can move to different areas. So I worked in the manufacturing line for a number of years and then I became a new products manager. So travelling to America, bringing the products back to the manufacturing line for them to, to build. Learned a lot about all the different products. Mm -hmm. I've had so many different roles at IBM. It was just different areas Different, all the time. Uh, yeah, exactly. So one of the fabulous ones that I had was that we brought the order desks from all over Europe. So sales teams putting an order into a system, they used to be able to do it in their own country. Mm -hmm. So when they were ordering IBM Green Oak products, the orders, we brought all the people from the different countries into Green Oak to run that. Oh, really? So we had 200 people across one floor in IBM, German, French, Spanish, Italian, and that was incredible. Was there any disappointment about not being a teacher? Where did, where had that dream gone? Well, what I actually realised eventually was I was teaching people for a long time. Of course, yeah. You know, the, the, the people, that traditionally, normally men that were in the first role that I was in, mm -hmm. that were all terrified about coming out of these systems, and a lot of them were very resistant to move from it. But because I, because I worked with them and helped understand what their problems were, I could help them gradually get comfortable with it. So you're kind of satisfying that urge to be a... Yeah. And this goes back to the attitude thing as well, I suppose, is you know, your, your attitude towards it is I'm, I'm teaching you I'm, and I'm doing something that gives me a lot of gratification and actually you're being helped. And yeah. in, in, at the same time, IBM spotting you with leadership potential because a leader and a teacher are very similar kind of inspirational things. So you, you, your career's going well. What what made you move then to Inverclyde Community Fund and Rig Arts? Well, because it sounds like a big, a huge <laughs> divergence. Yeah, well, it was there was a lot of other roles after that in IBM, so I was I ended up being the HR and innovation lead for the campus, mm -hmm. and that's when I'd realised that all of the all of these years I had been teaching people and helping them change, so it let me lead a change management organisation. And after that, I went into a European role and I was working in Europe for three years. And then at that point, IBM decided to change the pension. They tried over a number of years to change their pension schemes. Mm -hmm. And I had been in one of the best pension schemes from the beginning. And I'd been told right at the beginning, don't move out of this scheme. Yeah. So I'd managed to stay in it until this particular point when they were absolutely going to change it. And I thought, this is a message to say, this is the time to leave. And nobody wanted me to leave, and I was not particularly ready to leave, mm -hmm. but a lot of people left at the same time. And when I did decide to leave, there was a lot of people very unhappy that they were having to leave, and there was people who um, took the company to court, for example. Yeah, yeah. It was a whole big thing about it, and I thought, I don't want to do that because I've had a really good career, I've had a lot of opportunity, I've had lots of awards. I'm not happy that this is happening. And that was another, that's when the attitude thing comes mm. in. So instead I decided to fundraise for Save the Children when I was leaving and get people to dance. I love dancing. Mm. And um, I got I was like, get people to dance and raise money for Save the Children. So I started a little campaign when I was leaving, ended up getting to know people from Save the Children as a result, raised quite a bit of money for Save the Children and left in a happy note. 
So I was going to be a lady who lunches, which a few people have heard me saying already. <laughs> and I had so much energy because I'd gone for it's like kind of falling off a cliff when you're working mm -hmm. those hours and travelling all over and suddenly... You stop. I'm at home. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what to do with me because they think, what do you do in the house then? So very quickly, I, I took some time off, but very quickly I got involved with Save the Children, initially mm -hmm. doing fundraising, then being a speaking out volunteer for them. And they, they came to me and asked me if I would do a, a contract with them to teach innovation in their head office in London. So I did that for a, six months. So you, you've been a teacher again? Uh, probably, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. I hadn't actually thought about that. And I ended up getting the opportunity to go to Tanzania to learn about, it was about a week in Tanzania, to learn about the different projects say, the children were doing there mm -hmm. and bring that back as a speaking out volunteer. So basically, since I left IBM, I've been doing a lot of different um, volunteering, some consultancy work, but always about helping make a difference. Does it feel like you're making a difference, that you're doing good? Definitely. And one of the things that we do is we give the wind farm, for Inverclyde Community Fund, we give the wind farm an impact report mm. and just getting those stories together and reading them and all the different people. I mean, there was, during, um, at the end of last year, we had a real problem with people from cost of living crisis mm -hmm. and we gave out a number of winter grants. So we're the good thing about our uh, about Inverclyde Community Fund, we can very quickly react to giving people money. Yep. Once a month we meet as a board and quite often we'll have grants in a couple of nights before and we manage to turn them round to grant requests. We can turn them round on Because you've got the a very quick decision making process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, because we've got it set up the way we have. But it it's basically like you're working but you're not getting paid now. <laughs> but no, you're getting yeah. the you're getting the the feeling of you're making a difference. Yes, which which is hugely valuable. What, what about the other members of the board then? How many people are on the board? There's about 12 on the board. Right, so it's fairly big. Yeah, it's a variety. We've just taken some more on. and um, It's a variety of people in the public sector, the private sector and um, the third sector. So there's great experience across the board and it means that we can quickly point people in the right direction if they're looking for some support. And that's what we want to do. Mm. We want to give people seed funding. Yeah. And we don't... You want to see the growth. You we want, want to yeah. see the growth. Uh -huh. And it's great to see them come back to us. I mean, one of the other ones we're doing at the moment, sustainability grants, is there's a, an organisation, Morton in the Community, and they're giving boots and pieces as the, the, mm -hmm. um, the thing that they get money for. And basically it's about recycling outfits. So it's all about sustainability and helping make a difference. During COVID, we had some, it's a group called the Right Bunch, which was older ladies who were very, they used to meet once a month and because of COVID, they couldn't go out and they were getting to the stage they couldn't even be bothered talking on the phone. Mm. And they asked for some funding to give each other, to give them something to look forward to. So they all got to choose the person that was organising asked for the funding, asked them all what they would like. Mm -hmm. And one lady said she would like wool to knit things for children to recycle. And um, somebody else said she hadn't had flowers for ages. So they all got a different gift at yeah. different times. And they all started talking to each other and getting... Because it's a conversation starter. Yeah. Cause what, when did you, what when did, did you get? get? When did you get? get? Have you done with it? Superb. Absolutely superb. So it sounds like a fairly kind of happy story up to that. There must have been challenges along the way. I mean, what, what challenges have really stuck out to you? Well, there's lots of challenges, particularly an example is one when I was working in the order desk and we took all the different countries into in Greenock and we were, we were looking after orders. We were sitting in manufacturing. Sales teams would sell products. Mm -hmm. We'd build to order. So quite often they would tell us we want black something and then we would build black things and then they'd sell blue things and then complain that we hadn't let's just try to simplify it. Yeah. Then they would say, Why on earth, you know, have we not got this built? And it's because they'd asked for something different. Yeah. So we had huge discussions and debates and stress over all of that. And I remember one of the times things were going really badly and I was asked to go to Germany to talk to the customers and sales teams in Germany. So I knew I was going out to a meeting that was going to be very stressful. Mm. And when I got there, first of all, they lost my suitcase on the way there. So mm -hmm. this image that was going to be appearing 
couldn't be the same person because I didn't have my suitcase. And I got into the meeting and a lot of the German type, when I went to German meetings, they wanted to speak in German until I was speaking and then they would, they would change to English. So I couldn't understand, I didn't know what they were saying, but I knew they were all not happy with the presentation before I went up to speak. So I very quickly realised this isn't going to go well. So I, instead of using my presentation, I put a flip chart board up and I said, I know you're all not happy. Tell me the biggest problems with our delivery. And I just wrote all the things that they were saying. And as I was doing that, I thankfully realised that in my presentation, I had the answers to the things that yeah. they were all calling mm -hmm. out. So I was able to show the presentation and look as if I had actually, we'd actually been listening, which we had been. We knew what a lot of the problems were. But it reinforced were. it. Yeah, yeah, and it made people in the audience realise that I was listening, we were listening, it wasn't mm -hmm. going to just be a case of, you know, this is going to happen like that. And it was hard leaving, that was a challenge. You know, 32 years, lots oh, yeah. of different yeah. roles. Suddenly deciding to leave was not an easy thing to do. Mm. But I've... I keep kind of reinventing myself, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great thing, isn't it? You know, make, making sure that every time there's a bit of a change in a, in a journey, then you, know, you, you hit that change, you've got the right attitude for it and, and you push forward. So let me ask you this. Gone back in time, you've met the 12-year-old Helen. She wants to be a teacher. That's a dream. What one bit of advice are you going to give her? Believe in yourself. You know, you are really good at things that you do. But I've always, nearly, I think a lot of people like this, you think, I can't do that. Mm. I'm never going to be able to do that. I said that often, particularly at night before something traumatic the next day. And then I would get up the next day and I'd just go and do it anyway. You know, so if you know that, if you having that belief is not always easy. But I would tell myself, be more believing in yourself. Listen, thank you, Helen. That was great. A wonderful chat. Really yeah. enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everybody out there for watching this Business Roots Chat. You can find more of our Business Roots Chats on your usual podcast platforms where we talk to other interesting people just like Helen. If you want to know more about Inverclyde Community Fund or Rig Arts, then you can find them on the internet. Thanks again for joining us. But for now, see you soon.